Hello friends! Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another weekend reading vlog. Um, I have not read anything in well over a week now. And even before that, I was barely reading. I really haven't read anything since like my last reading vlog that I posted probably two weeks ago now, maybe, maybe more, but I also finished filming that vlog before that, like a, at least a week before that. So um, it's been a while since I've read, <laughs> but it is currently Friday. I am ready for the weekend, ready to, I don't know, be productive, do things, um, but, I am currently reading, I don't know what. I'm in the middle of like a bajillion things. Um, on audio though, I am pretty consistent with audio. If I have been reading recently, it has only been on audio. Um, and I am currently reading The Ballad of Perilous Graves um, by Alex Jennings, which is an Orbit release, I believe. Either Orbit or Red Hook, um, one of the two. Um, but I actually have an e-arc of this. I've had an e-arc of this for a while now because I've been wanting to read this, um, but I just haven't been able to get into it. However, I did just get the audiobook um, from Libro FM, and so I have been listening to this on audio. I'm 20% of the way through the book. I am sort of enjoying this book. Let me explain. So I didn't really know much about this book going into it. All I knew about it was that it took place in New Orleans and that it was the magic had to do with music and that's what like really drew me to it. Because it is an Orbit book, I am obviously going into this book expecting an adult book. However, if you know me at all, you will know I don't particularly like children in my books especially not POV characters and in adult books. If I want to read from the perspective of a child, I will pick up a middle grade book. I will not read an adult book that has children in it. Like I just, I don't know, call me a children hater, whatever. It's kind of like a, an urban fantasy type of thing um, where New Orleans is like run by magic and music is magic and art is magic. And it's like, really, the magic is really cool. I will say that I really like the magic. I really like the world building and the writing is really good as well. I just not, I'm not sold on the characters and I'm not sold on the story either. Let me explain. Like I said, New Orleans is run by like magic which comes in the form of like art and music and basically what happens is that there's these like nine songs um that are kind of like the heart and soul of the city and they get stolen and our main characters have to go and recover and find these songs and save the city basically our main characters are children for the most part. There is like one other character who is a trans man and I actually really like his POV a lot. He's just not a like, he's just not the main POV. He is like the adult POV though. So he's like basically the only POV that I like. And I'm disappointed because like, I've only had like two chapters from him and I'm just like, please, please give me, give me more, give me more of Casey, please. However, our main main characters is of course, Perilous Graves, um, as the title might suggest. But Perry is, I believe like 12, maybe 11, something like that. And basically he has a friend named Peaches who is this like, kind of like supernatural, has like super strength. Um, I believe she's also the same age as him. Um, and then the other kind of trio of children is um, Perry's sister, Brendy. Um, and basically the three of them are the ones who get tasked with saving the city. This book is very strange in that like at times it feels like a middle grade. And then obviously once you get to like the adult POV chapters, like when you get to Casey's chapters, they don't, it's obviously an adult book, but like, I just, I don't know if I like it. I don't know if I like that shift. It's very jarring to me. And again, I do not like POV children in my adult fantasies. And so I'm just, I'm just struggling. I'm really struggling with that fact. Um, and also because they're not just like young teenagers, like they're literal, like they're very young. Like they're very, very young. They read their age, which is very young. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna continue that. I think I'm gonna give it till around the halfway point just to see if I'm feeling it and decide at that point whether I'm gonna DNF it or not. Like I said, I think your mileage may vary. I, I very much recognize I'm probably not the target audience for this book. Um, it very much feels like a love letter to the city of New Orleans and also black culture within New Orleans. So like that's, I obviously recognize I'm not the target audience, but like I do, like I said, really like the writing and I really like the magic and the world building. I just, 
I don't like the characters. I don't like the children. And also I need the plot to pick up a little bit more because I'm not feeling the characters. You know what I'm saying? Um, but aside from that, I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to read. I'm probably going to pick up like one of my eBooks. I've accumulated a number of eBooks recently just because I've had like some gift cards to spend over from like Christmas and also from my birthday. And so like I have just been acquiring eBooks. It's a problem. Um, and so um, I have a number of ebooks. I'll probably pick one to start with um, sometime this weekend and I will check in with you once I have more updates. Tomorrow I am hopefully planning on going to um, a book fair. Uh, that's the plan. It's a, is it a book fair? A book festival? I'm not really sure. Um, but it's called Word on the Street. It takes place in Toronto. I think this is the first year they're having it since like 2019 um, because of COVID. Um, and I'm really excited. There's a couple of talks that I'm interested in. Um, Kate Hartfield, is that her name? She's the author of The Embroidered Book. It's like a magical Marie Antoinette like reimagining and I'm very very intrigued by it and it's very chunky. I've seen it in the store quite a lot um, and I wanted to get it but I knew that she was going to be at this festival so I kind of want to go see her talk and like hopefully maybe get a signed copy. I don't know um, but that's my plan for tomorrow but anyway that is enough for this like entirely way too long intro and I will see you later. Good morning, friends. Happy Saturday. Ooh, got a hiccup. Ignore the glare on my glasses. I don't know how to fix it. But I just wanted to check in. It is currently like 1130, I think, and I'm going to head out to the book festival earlier than anticipated. So originally the book chat I wanted to go to was for the embroidered book, um, which is at 130. But the problem is the weather forecast says it might rain starting from one o'clock onwards. And so like, I just don't want to risk that. I don't, I don't want to be caught out in the rain. I also am going to drive because it might rain so then I can get, make a quick getaway. Um, so that I don't have to walk like a really long time to get to the subway station. But yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go now. The, the festival opens at like noon. So I'm going to go a little bit earlier, try to get some parking. Um, I'm probably going to head out right after this check-in. Um, and there is a panel at noon that I was like vaguely interested in. I might check it out. I might just honestly go around the vendors and just like see what books I can pick up. Um, sometimes there's like some used book vendors there. Um, there's a lot of like indie bookstores and also like some local indie publishers are usually there as well. I know Dundurn Press is always there. Um, and I actually have not been keeping up with Dundurn Press's books. Um, so I kind of want to check out what they have. Coach House Books might be there. I hope they're there. They were there last time I went, which was actually in 2017 or 2018. But I will take you along with me. I will try to get some good footage. Um, I did want to give you updates on what I read last night though, because I actually did end up reading quite a lot on audio because I ended up cleaning my room, which you can't really tell because it's still kind of messy, but like it's a lot better than it used to be. I did decide to DNF uh, The Ballad of Perilous Graves. I got to kind of over the 40% mark, around the 43%, 44%, somewhere around there. Um, and I just decided I don't think it's for me. Like every, it's funny because like every time I'm like, I'm going to DNF it, it's another Casey chapter. And then I'm like intrigued again because I really like Casey's chapters. But then like every time I get to one of the like Perry chapters, I'm just like, must I hear about these children again? And I think the problem is also not just that like Perry is really young and Peaches is really young, is that like his younger sister Brendy is like younger than him. And so like, it's just, it feels so like childish, but like the book itself is not childish. And I just, I don't like that combo. Like if I'm going to read about children, I want the like lighthearted whimsy fun of like a middle grade. You know what I'm saying? But anyway. I digress. I think your mileage may vary. I do actually super recommend the audiobook. I think the narrator did a really good job, um, especially because there's parts of the book that are like in song and like I feel like the narrator does a really good job with those parts. I did really like the magic um, and I also think, again, I think it'll really just depend on like if you like the characters or not. I think the plot is like quite slow. I don't really like the pacing to be quite honest. The pacing is very strange to me because it feels urgent like there's a sense of urgency there but like nothing happens and so like it's like fast but slow and it's just like this weird contrast and I, I don't 
know if uh, it works for me, but it might work for you. Again, I just think this is one of those books where it's like, you might like it, you might not. I really don't know. Um, I do think the world building is really, really interesting. The magic is so cool. Um, and I think that the writing is actually really good too. I didn't realize that this was a debut novel, but I think it's like really, really solid for a debut for sure in terms of like just pure writing. Um, aside from that though, I did actually start and finish another audiobook. Um, and that is Counterfeit by Christian Chen. Um, I actually got an e-arc of this a while ago and I couldn't get more than like a chapter into it because it's one of those books that like doesn't have like quotation marks and stuff. It's basically because the narration style is basically this one woman telling like an inspector or like a some sort of inv an investigator like how this crime happened. So she's kind of telling them her story but in the book that like for some reason has no quotation marks. And I don't know, granted, I don't know if that's just an e-arc problem. And like, maybe that's not the case in the, the finished copy. So like, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, but I could not get through it. Like, that's one of my pet peeves. And so like, I just DNF'd it like very early on. Like I didn't even bother marking it on Goodreads or anything. Um, but I did say at the time on my NetGalley review, I was like, you know, if there's an audiobook, I think this would work really well on audiobook. And lo and behold, there's an audiobook. Um, and so I did give the audiobook a try. And I'm glad to say I had a really good time. It's a very short audiobook. I think it was only like four hours on the speed that I listened to. Um, and I ended up giving this book three out of five stars. I think it was like a really fun time. It was really like, you know, a solid, I don't know what genre this is. Like, it's the same genre that like, Leanne Moriarty writes in, you know what I mean? Like the, the big little lie type of vibe, that genre. I don't know what that's called, but it's that genre, like contemporary women's fiction, thriller, lady thrillers. It don't, I don't think this is quite a lady thriller though. Maybe it is, I'm not sure. But basically this book is primarily told from the perspective of this woman called Ava. Um, she is a former lawyer, um, went to Stanford Law, I think. Um, and like now she has a kid, her kid is two years old and she's on like extended mat leave because her kid is like really finicky and like just is not, you know, is not doing so well. Um, and she's not doing so well. She's kind of like, you know, how did I get here? Like, how did I go from being like a top lawyer to like this? Um, and so she's, she's, you know, struggling. And then she one day bumps into her old college roommate, Winnie, who, um, is from China. And she somehow through a series of events gets entangled up in Winnie's, um, counterfeit business. So what Winnie does is that she buys like legitimate goods. And then she also has like a counterfeit version of it. And then she returns the counterfeit version to the store and then gets the money for it and then also sells the real version online to like a like as a reseller so that's like her business and basically Ava gets caught up in that and she becomes part of the scheme and so like the book is told from Ava's perspective like I said for primarily anyway at the beginning um and she's like telling some sort of investigator or detective I don't know whatever it's an interesting story it's interesting I like the whole like unreliable narrator thing like I think it's it was entertaining like I said I think it's a solid read it was a fun time I don't think I'm gonna be thinking about this book very often. I don't think it's like super memorable, but I think it is a fun time if you like this type of book. Um, I definitely do recommend it. There's some commentary on like the model minority myth, which I thought was really interesting and kind of turning that on its head and like what that really means. And I really enjoyed that aspect of it as well. Um, but it's not super in depth. Like I wouldn't say it is, even though in the blurb, it makes it seem like it's like gonna have, be a prominent part of the conversation. Like it's touched upon, but I don't think it's like a huge part of it. It really just is an entertaining time. I think this would work really well as like a movie. Like, you know, the types of movie that start out with someone like in a room talking and then it like does flashbacks, you know, like I, I, I just think it would work really, really well as a film. Um, and so I do hope that someday it'll get a film adaptation. I'm not hopeful, but <laughs> um, we'll see. Um, but anyway, I've been talking for a while now. I'm going to head out. And like I said, I will take you with me before I go though. I have to show you. Kava is just so freaking cute. Look at her. Kava, say hi. Anyway, that is it for my check-in and I will see you all soon.
Hello friends, I am back home. It was a great festival. Honestly, I really miss just like going to festivals like this, like outdoor festivals. And Word on the Street is my favorite one, obviously, because I love books. It's also just like a really great way for me to figure out what's like being published locally. Um, obviously there's like the big publishers there, HarperCollins is there, Penguin, um, Simon & Schuster, um, but also a lot of like indie bookstores, indie presses are there, um, some self-published. Some of the self-published is a little, questionable I'm not gonna lie um but you, you know you you figure out very quickly like what is and isn't your kind of thing um there was like a really cute stand that was like just romance books as well that was so cute their stand was so fucking cute I have no self-control clearly and I might have bought a big stack of books so we're gonna unpack it together um and I do have my disinfectant wipes and I'm gonna wipe down the ones I can some of them are like very papery on the cover so I'm, I probably like I'm not gonna wipe those down because I really like I mean I, I don't want to wreck my books but you know it is what it is um the first book I picked up is Remnants oh can you even see this it's like so bright um Remnants by Celine I don't know how to pronounce her name she is a French author French Canadian I think possibly um but basically this was this is published by Book Hug Press which is the same um indie publisher that published You Are Eating an Orange, You Are Naked, which is one of my favorite literary fictions of all time. So I actually went to their stand and I asked them if I liked that book by them, like what else would I like? Um, and they recommended like a poetry book, which I was like, absolutely not for me. Um, but they also recommended this one, which I think is meant to be semi-biographical. Um, but basically it is an exploration of like relationships and like um, family through the lens of like someone who lost their father and they end up like I think the idea is that like she is interviewing people to get pieces of her father's life that she never knew and like it's about what's what what the remnants are of like a relationship left behind kind of thing which sounds really interesting to me I'm gonna read you a little bit of the back multiple versions of the author's father are presented while remnants of his life disappear achingly quickly what is left of someone who is not important enough to be archived how do we talk about what no longer exists um, and I think that this actually won the governor general's award for French fiction when it came out and this is obviously the translated English version but it is like mixed media it's like told in like um interview format for like the people that she interviewed some journals there's some pictures as well some letters it's really interesting i'm really intrigued to read this um i did pick up another book by them as well um which is this one let me give this a quick wipe and this is called i can't get you out of my mind by marianne apost apostolides apostolides i'm so sorry i am the worst i will leave all the books and the author is like written in the description below because I can't pronounce them and I have not had the time to look it up. Um, but this is um, an AI story. So I think it's kind of like science fiction-esque, um, but it's basically about a woman, I believe, who is trying to make ends meet. She's, you know, just living her life. Um, and she is presented with an opportunity to take part in a trial where she gets an AI device put into her brain. I think it's obviously gonna talk about like her experience, but also probably like greater themes of like privacy and like consciousness and like any, just, you know, the typical kind of themes that come up when you, you encounter a story like this where AI is like implanted into your brain. Um, interestingly, I'm also currently reading The City Inside, which also has a kind of like AI type thing inside your brain. Um, and so like, I, I'm very, I love stories like this. There's a short story in Ken Liu's um, the Paper Menagerie, another story that also touches on this topic. There's a Black Mirror episode about it in season one that I really enjoy. It's just like a topic, a theme that I really enjoy. So when I saw this book, I really wanted to pick it up. Um, moving on to this one. Can I wipe this? Is this a bad idea? Okay, this one seems like a bad idea to wipe down. But this is Where the Silver River Ends by Anna Kwan. Um, I believe she's a Canadian author. Yes, she is from Nova Scotia and Anna is a biracial uh, Chinese author um, and she, I don't actually don't really know what this book is about. I just heard people there talking about it and they were like, oh my God, Anna Kwan has a new book. This is her new book. And then they were like, oh, I must get it. And I was just like, guess I must get it too. I get, I get really swept up on these things. Um, it does say like themes for this book are, it delves deep into mixed race identity, systemic oppression, family reconciliation, and what happens when we gather the courage to slip out of the current and make our own way into the world. Um, and I'm very intrigued by this. Also the cover, cute, right? Cute. Also the size of this book, the size of these books are like 
So cute. I really like it. Um, anyway, moving on. I do actually have this like kind of blind date with a book kind of situation from Dundurn Press, um, which should I open it now? I guess I'll open it now. Um, they have these like little bundles. This was $10 and I think I, I'm feeling it and I think there's two books in it for like $10, so good. Um, but this is the Canadian fiction bundle. I almost got the mystery one, but I was like torn between them and then the person working there, she was like, oh, the Canadian fiction one is really good. A lot of stands had these like blind date with a book things, um, but this is the one, the one I was like most interested in. So I obviously like don't know what either of these books are, but there's one called Jacintha, I think. And then this one is called The Showrunner. Um, and I guess I'll read it. This one says, Richard, a professor of English literature and his wife, Carol, are injured in a landslide that destroys their home and takes the life of their student boarder. Richard heals from the injuries caused by the accident but emotionally traumatized, he withdraws into his own world, threatening his marriage. When the beautiful, intriguing Jacintha enrolls in his seminar on The Tempest, Richard gra gradually falls under her spell. But on the verge of succumbing to his desire, he receives information that shatters his, his belief in himself as a moral man. He, he tries to distance himself from Jacintha, but she has other plans that can only lead to more anguish for everyone involved. Interesting. She. This is from an author from Vancouver. Um, and then the next one... Let me just give it a wipe down, you know. Um, this one says, rising star showrunner Casey Mc Stacy McCready has one goal, to leave behind her nerd girl origins and become a power player. Like Anne Deloney, her former mentor and current producing partner, Anne, while, meanwhile, is feeling her age and losing her mind, but she'll be damned if she cedes control of their hit primetime TV show to Stacey. After Anne hires Jenna, a young actress, hoping to restart her stalled career as an assistant, the relationship between Anne and Stacey deteriorates into a blood feud. Soon, Jenna must choose whom to support and whom to betray in order to achieve her own ends. And Stacey will find out if she possesses the killer instinct needed to stay on top. This actually sounds really entertaining. This very much sounds like one of those like dramatic messy books and I I'm I'm okay with that. I'm very very much okay with that. The next two books I bought from an indie press, they're both novellas and they're both and I've never heard of this press before, but they're called Steliform Press. Um and basically their whole thing is that they publish um speculative fiction that focuses on the cultural impacts of climate change, which I thought was like super interesting, very much up my alley for sure. Um and so I picked up two novellas from them. The first is can you even see this? It's a little wet from my wiping down, but this is Arboreality by Rebecca Campbell. This is like very short. This is only like a hundred pages, I think. Um, and this is by a author from West Coast Canada. And this is the one that the person working there who apparently, I think she's the editor for these books, but she recommended this to me because I said I like purpley prose and weird stuff. And so she recommended me this one. Um, and I'll read you the back because again, I don't know what any of these books really are about. I just get really caught up in like the atmosphere and I end up buying books. Anyway, it says a professor in pandemic isolation rescues books from the flooded and collapsing McPherson library. A man plants fireweed on the hillside of his depopulated Vancouver Island suburb. An aspiring luthier poaches the last ancient Sitka spruce to make a violin for a child prodigy. Campbell's astonishing vision pulls the echoing effects of small acts and intimate moments through this multi-generational and interconnected story of how a West Coast community survives the ravages of climate change. Actually, this sounds very much up my alley. Um, I'm very, very excited for this. Um, and then the one that I picked up on my own because the cover really spoke to me, obviously, is After the Dragons by Cynthia Zhang. Also a novella, 150 pages. Um, it's, I'll read you the back. It says, now no longer hailed as gods and struggling in the overheated pollution of Beijing, only the Eastern dragons uh, survive. As drought plagues the aquatic creatures, a mysterious disease, Shaolong or burnt lung, afflicts the city's human inhabitants. Jaded college student Xiang Kaifei scours Beijing streets for abandoned dragons, distracting himself from his diagnosis. Elijah Ahmed, a biracial American medical researcher, is drawn to Beijing by the memory of his grandmother and her death by Shaolong. 
Interest in Beijing's dragons leads Kai and Eli into an unlikely partnership. With the resources of Kai's dragon rescue and Eli's immunology research, can the pair find a cure for Shalom and safety for the dragons? Eli and Kai must confront old ghosts and hard truths if there's any hope for themselves or the dragons they love. This sounds incredible. I'm really hoping this actually, like, is a really good little novella to read because, like, this sounds so up my alley, so... This sounds so interesting. I really am really excited for that one. And then the last two books are not indie published, um, but these are two the two traditionally published books that I bought. And the first one, of course, is the embroidered book, which I did say I was going to pick up. Um, I didn't actually go for the author's talk, um, but they did have signed copies. So I did pick up a signed copy of this. Um, it's very pretty. I don't know if you can see it but it's like signed in gold. It has a little stamp. Very cute. I'm really excited. Honestly, to be honest, I saw this book in store and I just thought it was like so delightfully like chunky that I really wanted to read it. I've heard it's a little, it's a little tedious to read, but like I'm, I'm okay with that. It's like not floppy though, considering it's a Harper Voyager book, but whatever it's fine um all I know about it is that it's like a Marie Antoinette like reimagining retelling I don't know reimagining I guess if it's history um but focusing more on her sister um but there's also like spells and like sewing and magic um and I'm really intrigued I'm really intrigued I'm really distracted but this must be the UK edition because they use single quotes and also like I said it's not like floppy at all interesting most interesting and then the last book I picked up was The School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan um this came out earlier this year and I was actually really intrigued by it this is a secondhand copy obviously or like some sort of a damaged copy I got it for five dollars though so I'm not complaining and I first saw this book in store and I was really attracted to the cover to be quite honest with you like I just really like this color um but I think it's about this woman who like has a daughter and then one day she makes a mistake and because they live in this like kind of dystopian ish society um she gets like whisked away to this school for bad mothers and they like teach her like good parenting or whatever and she has to like prove herself in order to get her daughter back um and I think there's meant to be some commentary on like the differences between like western upbringing and like parenting and ver versus like Chinese parenting which I think is super interesting um and I don't know I'm just like really intrigued by this I've heard a couple of people talk about this but not that many people um so I don't really know too much about it honestly just like really excited for all the books I have um and because I don't actually have a book right now that I'm reading well okay that's not true I have like a bajillion books that I'm currently in the middle of that I'm just like not feeling so I think I'm gonna pick one of the books that I have just purchased to start I don't know which one. I'm thinking like maybe this novella because this is the one that like really really calls to me but also um, I might start like Remnants for like a bit of a different non-speculative vibe. Um, but that is it for this overly long check-in. I'll probably continue vlogging until the end of tomorrow um, but I will keep you posted what book I end up starting um, and I will check in with you a little bit later. Good morning friends! Happy Sunday! I have some updates. I have some reading updates, shockingly. Um, I am only about 40, 30-ish, 30 35-ish pages from the end of After the Dragons by Cynthia Zhang. And I am happy to report that I am very much enjoying this book. If I were to describe this book in like my own words, I guess it's like a low fantasy, urban fantasy that takes place in kind of a alternate slash like near future Beijing. There's a lot going on actually. Like this book is so short, but it packs quite a punch in terms of uh, world building. Um, but in this version of Beijing, A, there are dragons everywhere. Dragons are basically like dogs. They're just like animals that roam around on the streets um but also have sort of been domesticated and so like people have them as pets and then there's also different types of dragons and so like it's very much like dogs and like different breeds of dogs also in this version of Beijing though um it is extremely polluted as it is in in our version of Beijing to be quite honest um but it is like so polluted to the point where people have started developing this disease called Shaolong and it's kind of like an autoimmune respiratory disease um, that affects people's lungs and it's like a chronic illness like it, it, it gradually affects the body until 
you know, your body completely shuts down and then people die. Um, and it is terminal, there's no cure for it. And then also going on is like, there's a citywide or like nationwide, countrywide, I actually don't know, but there's a drought going on. And so because dragons in Chinese mythology are water-based, like they're aquatic, they're not fire-breathing like Western dragons are. Um, so because they're aquatic animals, they're obviously suffering because of the drought, but also there's a crisis going on where like people who have had um, dragons no longer want them anymore because there's not enough water to go around so they just abandon dragons so there's a lot more stray dragons just like roaming around so there's the huge drought which is a problem there is this illness which is a problem there's just like a lot of commentary um obviously about climate change um but also just like all the things that come along with it and how like everything is like interconnected and there's quite a lot of commentary on how you can't really separate like capitalism for example um from the effects of um, climate change because it is like the rich who are like keeping making things shittier for us it's also like the idea that like um not feeling and not um being affected by climate change is a privilege and like the rich are the ones who benefit from that because they can just pay their way out of everything um and the poor and the the disenfranchised and the marginalized people are the ones who are the most affected by climate change and so they talk about that quite a lot in this book um in terms of characters though in terms of plot there isn't really much of a plot i'm not gonna lie this is very much like a slice of life kind of novella i would say is this a novella 150 pages i mean it feels like a novella i don't know a short novel whatever. So this is very much a slice of life. And also I didn't realize going into this, but it's queer. It's queer. Um, we have two main characters, uh, Kai and Eli. Um, and they are kind of that like grumpy sunshine dynamic a little bit. Kai is very like cynical and like, um, disillusioned by everything. And he's just like very, very angry about like a lot of things that are going on. Eli is just a fucking cinnamon roll. Like, <laughs> an absolute goddamn delight. Um, and I really, really like their dynamic a lot. Like they're just so fucking cute. They're so cute. They're so cute. Um, but it is just basically about them going about their lives, their day to day. Um, there really isn't much plot. I, I really could not tell you what the plot of this. And for that reason, I would actually, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna make a bold comp here. And I'm gonna say if you liked Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry, I think you will really, really like this. They are two very different books in the sense that like, there's nothing similar about them in terms of the story, in terms of the characters, the worlds, nothing is similar. However, I will say the vibes are the same to me in, in in a lot of ways because again they're both slice of life books they're both like very wholesome in a lot of ways i know this book like touches on a lot of like more complicated or like tougher topics like climate change and whatnot but i think the overall tone of this book is still very like lighthearted and whimsical like these dragons are the cutest fucking things you will ever see it's very like how to train your dragon like these little dragons do the cutest things. Like um, Kai has one that's like really attached to him. So like she just sits on like his shoulder and like wraps herself around his neck, just chills there. And I'm like, what a fucking cutie, what a cutie. And then they come across some that are like a little more like, you know, vicious. You know that meme of that like fat tiger that's like me. You know what I'm talking about. I'll put it up in case <laughs> in case you've never seen it. But like there's a lot of dragons that are like that where they're like described as like these very cute things and you just think they're super cute, but then they're also like, I will bite. I'm gonna bite. I'm angry. Um <laughs> and it's just so cute. Um, so I'm really, really enjoying this. Um have been annotating. I think the writing is like very descriptive but it's not flowery there are just like chunks of text that are pretty descriptive which is something that i really enjoy um i don't know if everyone would enjoy but i really enjoy it i find the writing pretty accessible though like i said it's not flowery so i think those descriptive passages work really well i can't really think of like a comp in terms of writing style but maybe someone like ken Liu or su lin tan i feel also write in that i think su lin tan is a little bit more lyrical but i think both of all of these authors are all like very accessible in their writing like they're not difficult to read in any way shape or form but there are just like really great descriptions and and metaphors being used in their writing which i really enjoy um but overall i am very impressed with this book i can't believe it's a debut apparently um but anyway yeah i have like about 30 40 pages left i'm gonna 
finish it and then let you know my final rating. The only like negative, I guess I would say, like I said, there is just no plot. It's not really a negative in the sense that like, I don't think this book was trying to do that, but I can see that being a problem for some readers, if that makes sense. Um, so do keep that in mind, but otherwise, so far I highly recommend this. But yeah, I'll check in with you once I've actually like finished the book and let you know my final rating and if I have any updated thoughts. Probably not, but I'll let you know. Um, but I am heading out to my parents now, so I don't know if I'll be able to finish this before then. Um, and I might start an audiobook on the way there and back. I'm not sure yet, but I will let you know and I will check in later. Hello friends! Just checking in and doing one final check-in. I am like truly exposing myself and my messy desk. Whatever, I never said I had an aesthetic. Um, but I did finish After the Dragons by Cynthia Zhang and I really loved this. I ended up giving this 4.5 stars out of 5. I don't have too much to add um, in addition to what I talked about, but like I just really think this is a really cute book. Like it's got a really cute and wholesome vibe to it. Um, but at the same time, it still discusses some like really interesting and like really necessary topics. You know, it's sold as like climate fiction, but it does also talk about like racism and capitalism and, and cultural differences because like the two main characters are culturally very different. Um, and so I think that's like a really interesting aspect of the book as well. The reason why for me, this isn't like a full five stars is that I do feel like there's a lot going on and I do feel like some of the threads like could have been flushed out a little bit more. Like I feel like this book could easily have been like maybe 200 pages, even 250 pages, and I would have gobbled it right up because I just really like this. I really love the world. I think for such a short book, it does do a pretty good job at the world building. Like you get a really good sense of like what's going on and kind of the, 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 dire circumstances that they're in um, in terms of like the environment. But again, like I said, the overall tone of this book is very cute, very wholesome. Do you see here the sirens? Anyway, I don't know if I already mentioned this in my last check-in, but I do think that if you like um, low stakes kind of slice of life fantasies like Legends and Lattes, you will, I think you will like this one, despite the stories um, being so different. I think you would enjoy this. I think fundamentally they're both kind of that kind of low stakes slice of life, I think. I just really liked it. I really liked it. I didn't think that this genre would be my kind of thing, but apparently it is because I've now read two and I have really, really enjoyed it. Actually, I read three this year, I think. Legends and Lattes, this, and then also Swords Point was also like a very slice of life fantasy, which I also really enjoyed and actually recently ordered the second book in that series that I need to get to. Um, so anyway, that's that book, 4.5 stars out of five. The other thing I have been reading is in the car, I started listening to The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gento. I think the author's name is. Um, and this is a thriller mystery kind of situation. And I have been intrigued by this because I really like the cover. And also I love the idea of like a whodunit mystery that takes place in a library. But this book is like way more interesting than I thought it would be, primarily because of the narrative structure. So the, the kind of premise of it is that there's this mystery. Um, there's a group of like four people who meet in a library. Two of them are writers and two of them are students, I believe. When they meet, they hear someone screaming um and so they're you know trying to figure out who it is and but then nothing happens from that but then the next day they find out that a woman's body has been found and they all are kind of like well it must have been that woman screaming right and so that kind of kicks off like a whole series of events right and that's kind of the mystery aspect of it but it's also like very meta in the way that like so the mystery story is happening but then inside this book there's actually like an author called Hannah who is writing this mystery book. And in between each chapter of the mystery book, there is like a man called Leo who is writing to Hannah. Um, and I think he's he must be like her like critique partner or some, some sort of writing buddy, I don't know. Um, but he is like offering his commentary on ch each chapter that she's been like sending him chapter by chapter. And, and because she is Australian, as is her main character, as is the author of this entire thing. So like the author of the actual book and the author of the book inside the book, and then the 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 author who is inside the inside mystery, they're all these like Australian authors. It's all very like Inception, okay? But basically, they're all Australian. There's this guy, Leo, who is like, who lives in Boston, where this mystery takes place. Um, and he kind of offers her advice on like Americanisms and also like geographical and like local 
research sort of thing. And Leo is also an aspiring writer and there's like a whole thing with that. And so like, it's just a very interesting story in that like, it's a story within a story that kind of like, you don't know what's going on. Like, what is the purpose of this whole Leo situation? He, I don't trust at all. I find him very sketchy. So like, I'm really intrigued by this story. It's very interesting to me that this is the narrative structure because I feel like the blurb on this book does not reveal that at all. The blurb on this book only tells you about like the inner story and not like, the one layer up, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, I'm really enjoying that. So I'm about 40, 45-ish percent of the way through that. And I think I have like two and a half hours more of the audiobook to go. Um, and so I'm going to listen to that for the rest of the day. Um, but I am gonna end the vlog here um, because it is the end of the weekend, unfortunately. Tomorrow's Monday. Um, and yeah, that is it for this vlog. As always, if you stuck around till the end, I super appreciate it. And that is it for today. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and comment down below. If you can't think of anything, leave me a dragon emoji. And if you like this video and you wanna see more from me, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. That is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time.